Just to run through the timetable for today, I will be speaking, followed by Dr. Anne Margaret Smith from Altwell, and then we'll have a short break, and then be followed by Aaron Smith from Microsoft, and then Pete, and then we're going to have the question and answers um, at the end of the afternoon. So, as Pete says, do put your questions to us, and we will answer them in the afternoon for you. So as Pete says, my name is Katrina Cochran. I have um, been working in the field of dyslexia for over 20 years with a wide range of um, adults, children, um, doing assessing and a lot of training. And it's lovely to have you here today. Today I'm going to be discussing um, dyslexia and the co-occurring conditions with dyslexia, as well as things like visual difficulties, and the strengths and challenges learners with dyslexia face, particularly those who are post 16. And then we're gonna spend a little bit of time discussing the options for your learners, screening, assessments, what might be the best thing for your learners to have. So apologies if I'm teaching anyone to suck eggs, but hopefully this will be some new information for you and um, you will get some, some good things at the end of the uh, the day as well. So if we go back to um, 2009, that was when all the organisations came together and actually came up with um, a definition of dyslexia, where it was seen as a learning difficulty that primarily affects the skills involved in accurate and fluent word reading and spelling. And it was seen that it wasn't just reading and spelling, but there were also these difficulties in phonological awareness, verbal memory and verbal processing speed. It was acknowledged that dyslexia occurs across the range of intellectual abilities. And although most people with dyslexia are of average or above average intelligence, you can have it at any point. And it's thought of as, as a continuum with no clear cutoff points. You can see in this slide how all the different difficulties do overlap and actually it's possible to be right there in the middle and have a little bit of everything. The biggest overlap is between dyspraxia and dyslexia and around about 60% of learners have both. You will also see that um, you can have a little bit of attention uh, deficit disorder and many learners do have these concentration difficulties um, that find that make it difficult for them to learn. They may have um, a little bit of autistic spectrum disorder where they take language very, very literally. We will have some more information about dyscalculia later today, but uh, within dyslexia, many learners have difficulties with maths in dyslexia. And it's often around the language of maths. And dysgraphia, difficulties with handwriting as well. So lots and lots of things that we need to look at with the learner, not just dyslexia, bearing in mind all the different difficulties as well that that learner might have. We know that dyslexia is genetic. They have identified the gene that carries dyslexia. Um, they estimate that between one in four and one in six apprentices will be neurodivergent. That means having one of the difficulties or more on that slide beforehand. Those are huge numbers. And if you're working with apprentices, um, are you able to identify those who have neurodivergent difficulties? Have they been identified? Probably not. Probably those apprentices or sixth formers are struggling on um, and trying to hide their difficulties. We know equal numbers of men and women are dyslexic. Um, I used to see a lot more boys, a lot more men with dyslexia and I used to assess um, very unequal numbers, but actually I'm seeing a lot more um, women coming forward, girls coming forward for assessment. And as I said before, it mainly affects accurate and fluent reading and spelling. But obviously those adults who go on to university have got good reading skills. Um, it's the 
um, amount of text that they're reading and the speed that they're reading at that is impaired. You can't cure dyslexia, but you can become a compensated dyslexic. You'll find that some, um, some learners do have visual difficulties and this is what a piece of text may look like to somebody with dyslexia. I have worked with people who've said that they have seen pixels in front of their eyes or the text jumping about on the page. And for them, it's normal. And they think it's the same for everybody. So it's always worth asking that question about text. Obviously things like um, black print on white can be very, very difficult. And if you can see um, my screen, the, the slides are all on a creamy background because that's much easier for somebody with visual difficulties to, um, to read. Coloured overlays may help. Um, and you can see there the effect of different colours on text can make it easier. And you will see some adults who have got tracking difficulties where they are still using their finger to underline the text as they read. So sometimes the coloured overlays with the um, isolated text on it or the tracking line can really help. Obviously things like changing the background colour of your laptop can help as well. And Aaron this afternoon will give lots more ideas about assistive technology to support learners. But things like colour overlays, they're cheap and well worth investigating for some learners. Um, some may need a, an optometrist appointment as well. So what do all these things mean for, for your learner with dyslexia? It can mean a range of things and often it means huge frustration for them. They may have memory issues. Um, our memory is divided into three different distinct areas. We have our short-term memory, our long-term memory, and our working memory. Um, and there's often nothing wrong with the long-term memory of the learner who can remember how to ride a bike if they haven't been on a bike for 10 years. What they have problems with is transferring information across from the short-term to the long-term and vice versa. Uh, so you'll often find them have this, um, oh, it's at the tip of my tongue kind of um, feeling and um, they can't find that word that they're looking for. Short term memory is the, the memory that your, your brain is just taking on board very, very quickly and deciding what to do with it. And that's often um, information that, they, that they're hearing. So in the classroom, they are forgetting information very quickly if they're just hearing it without it being backed up with written information. And then the working memory is the information that you're holding in your head and manipulating. And for these learners, they may not be able to multitask. Um, and things like times tables are, are never learned, are they? So the memory, I think, has a huge impact in, in the dyslexic learner. Obviously, for any kind of exams, they may think they can um, cram for the exam, but they can't. And, um, and that can have huge difficulties for them if they're doing any kind of exam. The other thing that I find all dyslexic learners have in common is, is processing difficulties. Um, so the memory and the processing, even if they have got good reading, spelling skills, whatever, um, the memory and the processing uh, have got enormous difficulties in. Um, and this is um, the ability to, to take in all that information, everything that we're hearing, we're smelling, we're tasting, we're touching, we're doing. Your brain is, is very quickly processing that information and it's analysing it, it's synthesising it, it's sequencing it and it's checking it. And then the output is in how the understanding is. So that could be in drawing, making notes, writing, talking, essay writing. With the dyslexic learner, all of that process is much, much slower. And so the output is much slower. And this is why they need that extra time to be able to 
draw, to be able to write notes, make notes, all of that extra time that they need to be able to, to be on, a, on an equal footing with their peers. And one of the ways I, I describe this is that um, if you remember the old days of dial-up and the internet, when we had to plug in the, the internet into the phone line, it was a really frustrating business, wasn't it? And um, it, you got there in the end, but you would lose the connection, you'd have to reconnect, and it would take so much longer and be very frustrating. So sometimes if you've got these processing difficulties, it's as if everyone else is on dial-up, but you're stuck on, uh, sorry, everyone else is on high-speed broadband, but you're stuck on dial-up. And it's very, very frustrating. What I see often with learners is good days and bad days. And sometimes that wiring is connecting and it's fine. And then other days it's just not making those connections and, and it's a completely different story. And again, it's very frustrating. And of course, obviously, um, information is being discarded by the brain because the brain doesn't think it's important enough to keep, put in the long-term memory. Um, and for the dyslex dyslexic learner, sometimes the important information is being discarded incorrectly. For the dyslexic learner, all of these things can, um, can be a complete overload, can't they? Um, verbal instructions, if they are, are fired up with loads and loads of different verbal instructions, they are completely overloaded and they'll, they'll just lose everything. Many adults don't understand time. They don't know how to um, use a conventional clock even. Um, so obviously the mobile phones are, are great because they just use a digital clock, but they often don't have those, the, the, the ability to understand what in 10 minutes is or next week. Um, I've got a very compensated dyslexic time, but if I say to him, I'm going to see you a week Tuesday, uh, he'll say to me, you know, mum, I just, you know, I don't understand that. But apart from that, he's, he's very, very compensated. If they are slightly on the dyspraxic side, you'll see that they're very badly organized. So they may not know um, where they are or what they're doing or what book they should be bringing. Um, and that organization is, is, is very poor. Again, if they are on the dyspraxic side, they may have difficulties still as adults with left and right or processing lots of information. So coming up to a um, when they learn to drive, coming up to a roundabout where they've got to think of a, a sequence of events, they may find it very difficult to know what to do at a roundabout to make those quick decisions. If they're on the slightly on the ASD side, then what you find is that they have poor inferential skills. So looking at a piece of text, they may get the black and white meaning, but they just don't get that deeper underlying meaning. And all of these things do lead to poor self-esteem, particularly for the adult learner who has um, struggled for years to avoid being found out. And they're often very, very good at, at avoiding being found out. Um, it will lead to poor self-esteem. Other difficulties may be around uh, processing large quantities of text. They often say that they have to reread a sentence, read a sentence and reread it, or they may have tracking difficulties and go on to the next line um, and miss out chunks of text and then not get the context, the comprehension of the text correctly. They may have poor spelling, but to be honest, having worked with um, many, many uh, adults as an English teacher, um, spelling isn't generally very good anyway, is it? Um, so they can, can avoid being detected through that. But things like note making and note taking, um, we've picked up those skills through osmosis almost. But for the dyslexic learner, nobody's actually told them or taught them how to to do these skills, so they don't know how to do them. They have poor revision skills, and they can't proofread. 
they cannot see the mistakes that they're making. Sometimes they can see the mistakes um, other people are making. So um, sometimes it's good to swap over if you're doing any proofreading. They can see the other person's mistakes. And their handwriting may be um, illegible, particularly if they are on the dyspraxic side. And they will have huge difficulties copying from a whiteboard. What you sometimes see is in the classroom something called the, the dyslexic nod. Uh, where the, the learner will look up at the whiteboard, try and remember the information on the whiteboard, look down to write it on their notes, and they've completely forgotten what they've seen. So they will have to look up and look down far more often, and you will see this dyslexic nod in the classroom often. Dyslexic learners will have huge problems doing anything with a sequence. So they may not have secure alphabet skills either. If you ask an adult, uh, what's the letter after M, often they have to go right the way through the alphabet until they tell you N. So that can have an impact if they are still needing to use a dictionary or to use um, a library, for example. How do you know? Um, where to find a book if you don't know your, your alphabet. Multitasking is difficult and reacting quickly in busy environments. It can be difficult to read information on charts, for example, um, if the information is presented on different levels, so if they have to read both across and down. And they have tremendous difficulties reading quickly and can find scanning or skimming difficult when the text is particularly black print on white. Medical, pharmacological language, abbreviations um, are very, very difficult for them. And uh, they might find it hard to work out readings or give inaccurate readings. Particularly if they have uh, difficulties with transposing uh, numbers, so sixes and nines are often um, reversed. You know, it would be nice if there was uh, one size fits all for all these learners, but there isn't. We have to take a very, very individual approach to them all. And sadly, you know, the, the it would be nice if, if we could just find one thing to, to help them all, but we don't. We have to have a very um, individual approach to their learning and their learning needs. Obviously, I think for these learners, some kind of testing is really, really important. Um, obviously, you want to be able to find out why they've not made any progress um, so far. You want to find an explanation for their, you know, for that, for that learner who's very, very verbally very good, but on paper it just doesn't match up. You might want to have some sort of testing put in place so that you can support that person better. And it may be that you want to put in place access arrangements for them. So I think the, the role of testing is very important. There are lots of things that you can use to assess or to screen. And obviously the questionnaires and the screeners um, are very good, but they don't diagnose dyslexia. So there are three questionnaires that are out there. Um, you've got the, the BTA adult questionnaire and you were given handouts with, with these things. So you've got the, the free Finnegrad questionnaire that was developed by a psychologist. It's quite old. Um, it does talk about things like checks. Um, it, does, it is a little bit old fashioned, but it does give you a bit of an idea um, about that adult. The DIDA is the dyspraxia interview um, for adults, the diagnostic interview for dyspraxia. And that's been developed by Professor Amanda Kirby. And it gives a lot of information. You, you ask a lot of information about the, the adult's um, childhood, um, early years, things about 
um, birth difficulties, uh, gross fine motor skills difficulties. Um, and for the adult, Professor Kirby says that if there was no evidence in childhood of dyspraxia, then they're not dyspraxic. But generally speaking, these are adults who have had um, perhaps difficulties with coordination, um, with using a knife and fork, with um, reaching developmental milestones at the right ages. And you're putting together all of this information to make a reasonable um, suggestion that they might be dyspraxic. So those are free. Um, you've also got the, the visual difficulties protocol that you can, can download from the SASC website, sasc.org.uk. And that will ask questions about visual difficulties and allow you to refer somebody on to an optometrist. The commercial screeners, um, you've got the Do It Profiler and you've got the Dyslexia Adult Screening Test. Both of those are widely used with post-16s. And then finally, you've also got the diagnostic assessment, which can either be with a psychologist who's a um, healthcare professional registered or with a specialist teacher with an assessment practicing certificate. The DAST is probably, um, it's, it's, it's fairly old now, um, but it was the very first one that was commercially published um, by, by um, Angela Fawcett and Rod Nicholson in 2004. It's used for um, adults from 16 years, five months upwards, and it's fairly quick, it takes 30 minutes. And once you've bought the kit for around about £250, then you've got that kit. Um, you don't have to buy a license afterwards. And um, the questions that it will ask are things around about um, reading, spelling. Can you see there the backwards span? So the, um, this, will, um, this is used to, to find out whether or not a person has got difficulties with their working memory. So they have to repeat those numbers backwards. That can be quite tricky. Phonemic segmentation. Um, so um, say the word rainbow, but say it again without the word rain. So the, the response would be bow. All of these things are little snapshots of, of the longer tests that a specialist teacher or an assessor would do. Um, and they would do rapid naming, uh, verbal and non-verbal reasoning, and um, looking at spelling and literacy skills. So it's, it's not a bad test. Um, but I say 2004, it's a little bit um, old now. Something that's newer is the Do It Profiler from Professor Amanda Kirby. And um, she's also got this app, the Neurodiversity app, that only takes five to ten minutes and is cheap, two, $2.99. And um, it does give um, a nice report as well. And it's a cheap way of finding out whether or not somebody has got underlying difficulties if they don't need a, any, a full diagnostic test, for example. It won't give you the evidence for access arrangements, though. So the app is just an individual pro, um, purchase, but the Do It Profiler is um, used for um, a license. So you'd get a license for that and, and do that on, on individual learners. But both of these are good. I have done the, the neurodiversity app on myself and uh, I think it was pretty accurate actually. Um, but cheap and a good, good way forward. So those are both, both things that you could think about doing with your learners just to get an idea of their strengths and, and challenges. And often for the dyslexic learner, it's, it's a relief often. Um, if you have, if you can find out that there is something like dyslexia there, it's often a huge relief. It can also be a time where the learner does find it, it um, emotionally difficult as well, because if they have been keeping it all inside and avoiding being found out, then um, 
being given that diagnosis can have quite a, um, an emotional side to it for them. And I have had learners that I have assessed who have, have found it very difficult to take that diagnosis on board. Um, and they've almost gone through a period of mourning where they think about, well, I could have done this. I thought if I'd found this out earlier, I could have done that. Um, and um, it, it can be quite difficult for them. But there are organisations like groups, which is uh, G-R-O-O-O-P-S, um, that do counselling to help people get over the emotional side of, of dyslexia. And they're really, really good. So you've, you've got the, the Vinegrad Dyslexia Checklist, um, the 20 questions, as I say, a little bit old fashioned, but it's fairly accurate and free to download. You've also got the BDA Adult Checklist um, that I find quite complicated to score, but it is free um, and uh, it's, it's worthwhile looking at the, the differences between the two. But in terms of a, a quick checklist, then maybe the Vinegrad is, is a little bit quicker. Then you've got the dyspraxia interview for adults, the DIDA, and the visual questionnaire from SASC. So all of those things are free. And, uh, you know, worthwhile maybe doing them on, on a colleague first. Um, never let somebody do it by themselves, but go through the questions with them. If you are, as an organisation, looking at whether or not to invest in, in a screening tool, make sure that you've got these top five components. It should include a phonological assessment. It should examine memory, sequencing and processing speed. And it should be research based. Lots of these things have got um, very big numbers of, of people that they have done the research on and they're, they're very, very good, solid screening tools. It should be time efficient and it should be cost effective and it should provide an easily accessible report afterwards that gives guidelines and, and recommendations for what you should do next. If you are carrying out screening on anybody using one of the free tools or one of the commercial tools, there's always the same process to it. There's an eight step process. You do need to review all of your existing information. So you might have information from previous schools, um, previous employers. Um, you may have um, done, uh, somebody may come to you with some, some previous questionnaires filled out. They may have had um, extra time already in school. They may have worked with a teaching assistant in school, but never had a formal diagnosis. So um, if you can ask things like, is, is there dyslexia in the family? That's always worth knowing as well because of the, the genetic nature of it. Seek permission for further investigation if it's needed. Um, complete any kinds of um, questionnaires that you might have as background questionnaires. Um, you may want to find out some things like, like um, developmental milestones, that kind of thing. Um, what information they're coming to you with. Then complete the checklist or the screener. And then very important that you discuss what you're going to do with the adult because they can be very, very, uh, it's just, it can be very difficult for them because they may feel quite vulnerable. So discuss what you're going to be doing with them. Do the tests and evaluate the results and develop the individual profile. And then very importantly, provide feedback to all the people involved. So the student or the employee or the line manager. Very important that, that you don't just let that person go away thinking, well, what's next? I don't know what's, what's gonna happen next and what, what are the results? For any kind of testing that you do, it's very important that you set up the testing um, in a very quiet and undisturbed environment. Um, sometimes it's easier said than done. I've been doing testing where fire alarms have gone off. Um, there's always something isn't there in the background. 
but if you can try and set it up in a very quiet environment where there's not lots of information on the walls around you so that the person gets distracted um, and that it's a very very easy environment for them to be in that they feel comfortable and relaxed and that there is enough time to complete all of the information that you're doing all of the, the testing that you've got enough time for and that the person isn't rushed always stick to the same procedure when you're running the test and keep notes as you go along as well so if that person is um, lacking concentration and finding it very difficult to to understand what you're saying how to do the test keep notes about it obviously at the moment we are having to observe social distancing and um, although I haven't done any assessments for, for several months, I am starting to book in assessments myself. But you do need to observe uh, the two metre rule and you do need to clean any equipment after. Um, and it may be that you need to, to wear gloves and masks as well. That's a picture of me doing an assessment on, a, on an adult um, and um, there are some positive aspects to having a full diagnostic assessment. They are more expensive, obviously the, the screeners that I, I showed you, they're, they're much cheaper, um, but a diagnostic assessment now can last all the way through to university. So if the assessor had a current assessment practicing certificate at the time of writing the report, that assessment can last for a long time. So it may be that um, if that person has an assessment done at 10, that assessment is now current with you um, for that adult. So always worth checking what they've had done already. But it may be that you think that a diagnostic assessment is the best way to find out the strengths and weaknesses of that, of that learner. If you look at this slide, it shows you the normal distribution curve. And what we find is that with the learner, uh, if we do do a full diagnostic assessment with them, generally their ability levels are on the right hand side. So they are, are generally uh, bright. They're of average, above average intelligence. So the bulge there shows the average intelligence there. And they're normally on the right hand side. Um, but in terms of their attainment, and many of the other tests, they're on the left-hand side. Um, so it's often very clear to see um, the dyslexic profile of the learner. So this is a, um, a graph that you might see on a, on a diagnostic assessment afterwards showing the typical spiky profile of the dyslexic learner. So you'll see here that the tests underneath here, um, the first five bars are for the ability tests. So vocabulary and um, nonverbal ability. Diamonds is a test of nonverbal ability. And then the, the further four, four, further five, sorry, are um, tests of um, memory processing and clerical speed and then the last four are attainment tests so the RAT5 is a test of, of spelling and reading and also the TARI is a test of reading um, words at speed and, and phonological decoding and then the DASH is a handwriting test so you can see there the peaks and troughs of that learner um, they have got good solid um, verbal ability so 100 is average but you can see there that they've got ACI is the attention concentration index they have got huge problems with their, their memory with their phonological awareness and um, their spelling so they've only come out at 70 with their spelling so they're going to really struggle aren't they um, with their in, in the classroom being able to remember what they're hearing um, being able to um, spell correctly, be able to write quickly, 
and for this person they would be able to get access arrangements so the 80 would be underneath the 84 needed for um, the criteria for extra time they would get extra time for for any kind of exams or anything like that um, because they do so poorly with the spelling you've got 70 in the spelling they would also get a scribe um, but actually their reading is okay um, so they wouldn't get a reader in this instance so do ask me any questions say about any of the any of the slides and um, we can go through any of these slides at, at the end as well but hopefully you can see there the, the typical spiky profile for a dyslexic adult and you can see there the range of tests that are given um, to somebody uh, in a full diagnostic assessment obviously a psychologist will have different tests they will have uh, something called a um, a WACE, a Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale rather than that RIT which is the wide range intelligence test that the specialist teacher uses Testing in a diagnostic assessment with an adult normally takes around about three, three and a half hours and we give quite a detailed pre-assessment questionnaire in advance. That will be to ask how somebody feels they are in lots of different situations to do with memory, concentration, maths, all sorts of things um, in advance. We get as much information as we can in advance. And then the assessor looks at three distinct areas, cognitive ability, the verbal and the non-verbal, the memory and the phonological processing. So those were those initial bars on that um, scale on the previous slide. Then we'll look at other areas. Now we can't diagnose um, ADHD, we can't diagnose ASD, but we can look at how somebody does in those particular areas and give additional questionnaires to come up with further recommendations and signposting. We may well give that DIDA, dyspraxia adult interview, and for an adult we are able to diagnose dyspraxia as well as dyslexia. And then we'll look at the attainment in reading, spelling and writing. Any kind of feedback, you do need to say how long it's going to take to um, give feedback. Don't let that person carry on waiting. Give that feedback promptly. Be very specific. Be very encouraging. We try and make our reports very positive and pick out the things that the person is good at as well as their challenges. And comment how, how pleased we are about their success so far. But very importantly, give details of what's going to happen next. Now, that could be as a result of the screening, of the assessment, or even a questionnaire. So be very, very specific about what you're going to be doing next. The assessment report should highlight areas of strengths as well as challenges, and it will give detailed recommendations, for example, to do with access arrangements, resources, and strategies that will help them both at work and in their courses. So for most people it's a very positive experience having the assessment done. I have never had an adult come to me for assessment who has found it uh, too difficult, too, too challenging or, or not a positive experience and actually for many of them it's the start of a lot of a new life for them often. In the report we may suggest access arrangements um, and these can also be done by uh, level seven, uh, people with a level seven qualification uh, under JCQ regulations. So this could be around extra time, it's generally 25% but it could be more. For the adult who has anxiety then we may suggest rest breaks are better for them. We could suggest uh, reading pens or human readers for particular exams. 
Um, it may be that we suggest that the person reads their um, exam paper out loud, that they have a better ability when they read out loud, they can hear their own voice and that's much easier for them. It may be that we suggest scribes or being able to use uh, word processing computers. Or it may be modified papers, so it may be that we suggest that they can use their coloured overlay or that the papers are printed on coloured paper, particular coloured paper. So there are lots and lots of different access arrangements that we can suggest. It's always important to be as dyslexia friendly as possible. So um, if you can use a dyslexia friendly font like Arial, Calibri or Comic Sans, they're all dyslexia friendly. Don't use Times New Roman and do not use italics. They're really difficult to, um, to read. I remember teaching a, um, an adult to read um, and he'd never taken his wife out to a restaurant because he could never read um, and he felt embarrassed about it. And we got him to the point where he was confident enough to take his wife out to a restaurant. And the next week I asked him how he got on and he said they'd had to leave the restaurant because the menu was in italics. And I realized then how difficult certain fonts are to, to dyslexics to read. Try and make anything that you are working on at least 12 or 14 font size. If the um, print is too small, that makes it very difficult as well. Have nice line spacing between your text and make it left justified so that the dyslexic reader can see that jagged pattern down the right hand side of the page. It's much easier for rereading them. There's more information on the BDA style guide about all of these different things, presenting things, um, if you download that from the BDA and that's www.bdadyslexia.org.uk. Pete will be talking more about difficulties with maths, but you know, there are lots of difficulties with maths in dyslexia um, that aren't connected necessarily with dyscalculia. But as I say, difficulties remembering times tables, reversing numbers, putting your answers in a sequence, or actually showing you're working out. Most um, dyslexic learners just want to go right for the answer without doing any working out. Um, Pete will, I'm sure, describe what subitizing is later on, but um, that is where we know automatically that five dots equals five, but for the dyslexic learner, they have to um, add up each dot to give you the answer five. And as I say, the language of maths can be difficult and they find it very, very difficult to estimate up or down, or round up or round down. If you are, if somebody has got difficulties with their times tables, um, when I was working with, with adult learners, I would get them to um, work out times square, do, you know, print off lots of blank times squares, work out what the, um, write out as much of a blank times square as you can, um, and then get faster and faster and faster with it um, until they can do a complete time square in normally about under three minutes if you work at it. And then if they have got extra time in a maths exam, then they spend that time usefully uh, on a piece of rough paper, go straight into the exam, put out their time square and use their extra time in a useful way. And also if they're worried about the exam, then it focuses them a bit better by doing something. Um, and then it frees up the working memory as well to think about other things. Always worth investing in some, some resources that might help your learners. Things like noise reducing headphones can be really, really good for learners who are actually distressed by the noise around them. The environment's really important. And often the classrooms have got very, um, the, the strip lighting that gives learners headaches. Um, sometimes the walls are very bright white as well, um, have little ventilation. All of this is really important for the dyslexic learner. You might want to have a, a load of highlighter pens, coloured overlays, 
Um, using things like Kindles are really, really good because they're a very grey, uh, matte background, and so it's much easier for the learner to read on a Kindle often. Obviously, iPads are fantastic if you can go to iPads and reading pens. Um, mobile phones are a fantastic source of assistive technology. Obviously, if the learner can't touch type, then um, teaching touch typing skills is really good for them because their handwriting may be illegible. Um, the BBC Dance Mat has a free touch typing course as well that can be suitable for, for adults. So well worth investigating things like that. So I've got a couple of um, case studies here, um, people that I work with in the past. Um, if, we've, if you've got um, time to just have a look at this and just maybe jot down a few things on the chat that might help them. So this is Emma. Emma works for a large wine company in the communications department. She's got three line managers and is starting a level three wine qualification after work one day a week. She thinks she's dyslexic and has taken an online screen of which suggests that she is. Emma has particular difficulties with taking notes in meetings and remembering all the names of the 1500 wines that they sell. When she reads, print jumps about and she's often exhausted after her course. She was very unwilling to share the results of her screener with her HR department. Um, have a think about what you might suggest to support Emma um, at the moment. So I'll just leave that up there for a minute. And i um, just got a question here about the counselling site. That was groups. That was um, www.groops. Um, I think they're .co.uk. And they do um, consultations by um, Skype as well. And then I've gone to the case study two. Paul is a student nurse. He struggles with doing drug rounds for the patients and they're on a huge number of different medications and he's often distracted while working it all out. He said that some forms were on the computer and some he had to print out and then he got confused, often got confused with the different kinds of forms. He found it particularly difficult when the consultants would give him uh, several verbal instructions at once and they were often impatient with him. He found it very difficult to do mental maths and he often got his sixes and nines muddled up. So you know, if anyone has any ideas on how to support Paul, do add to the chat room. So I'll leave that up there for a minute as well. So if anyone's got any ideas that might support Emma or Paul, I'll go back to Emma here, just um, stick down your ideas on the chat and we can just have a quick discussion about Emma and Paul. So that's Emma with the, the wine company. She actually, Emma came to me to do a, um, a workplace needs assessment, but she was so unwilling to share her dyslexia with her employer that she wanted me to do the workplace needs assessment from her home um, so I had to um, amend how I normally do a workplace needs assessment. So um, yeah so we are oh, right so that's a nice um, nice Nice one from Anne-Margaret, remembering the wine names, but putting them into a song. That's nice. Yes, definitely. Anything to do with um, remembering things in a silly way can often help. Um, and then someone suggested for Emma using voice recordings and dictations and also coloured overlays and paper. 
So they're really good suggestions there. Um, I, th I think with Emma, um, one of the things that I, I suggested was, you know, a lot of it was around confidence with her um, and really building on her confidence until she, she did find that she could go into HR and discuss that screen with, with them. But one of the practical things that I did suggest was that she was so exhausted and often with dyslexia, um, people find it exhausting because they're trying to keep up all day long. If you're dyslexic, you put in 150% and it is exhausting. So what I suggested with her line manager was that she worked from home the, the day of her course so that she went to her course from home rather than after being a day in the office. Obviously everything's completely different at the moment but that did that did help her. And obviously the thing about the, the reading, a print, a print jumping about, um, you know, I did recommend an optometrist for her because it did look like she had uh, visual difficulties. With Paul, um, I'm just checking whether or not anyone else has added anything. So uh, could Paul have colour coding for the doses and the medications? Yes, definitely. I think colour is a really good way of, of helping and supporting these, these adults. Um, and also um, that consultants need to be aware of neurodiversity. Quite right, Anne-Margaret. They need a dyslexia awareness raising course. I think that's really important. It's, it's working on, on raising awareness with your colleagues so that they don't give you several verbal instructions at once. They're not impatient because they understand the difficulties that that, that person has. And it's not to do with lack of intelligence or anything like that. So yes, I think those are all really, really good, good suggestions. Um, I don't know whether or not um, this is possible on the ward, but think that if, if Paul could wear um, earphones maybe, um, that might help him concentrate better, but that might not be possible. And perhaps somebody who, who's listening today, who's um, working for the NHS might be able to tell me actually whether or not that would be possible. I think also maybe I'd, I'd ask whether or not he did prefer working on the computer or printing off the forms and having that kind of um, consistency that either everything was printed out or everything was on the computer for him. But certainly I think the, the awareness is, is really important. I think also it's really important to finish with the fact that um, there are lots of positive things about being dyslexic. As I say, my son, who's the, the compensated dyslexic, who's doing really well working for Amazon, um, he feels sorry for people who aren't dyslexic because he, he recognises the, the, the positive side to his dyslexia that has allowed him to succeed. Um, it was difficult when he was a child, believe me, but now every, you know, things are, are positive uh, for him. Um, they often have huge empathy. They're often very resilient. They're very, um, they see dyslexia as a secret weapon. Um, and there's a very good BDA short video on their BDA YouTube channel, which is called um, A Differently Wired Brain. And it has adults talking about dyslexia. And there's, there's a couple of musicians talking about the their dyslexia being a secret weapon and their hidden power. And it's a really, really positive video if you can get to show it at all. But they're very creative, obviously. They see the big picture and verbally, they're very, very articulate often. So I've got here, oh, that is the, I have put down that groups website, www.groups.org, no, groups.org, that's all. Um, have a look at any of these websites. You've got all of these um, sent you in advance and that Differently Wired Brain, the BDA film, is really excellent. So thank you very much for listening. Um, those are my email details below. Do contact me if I can help at any time. Um, but thank you very much. Um, I'll just check whether or not Anne Margaret is... is there. I know I Margaret joined in on the questions, so that was great. Katrina. Um, Hello, Pete. I've got a question that I think is probably um, strike while the iron's hot. Yes. Because it, it relates to diagnostic assessment. Yep. So um, this is from Claire. When would a diagnostic assessment need to be recompleted? And the context is that she's thinking that some of their learners don't access uni until they're age 30 or more. Yep. 
So would a previous diagnostic assessment still apply if they've gone 10, 12 years since their last assessment? If that person had a current assessment practicing certificate or the psychologist was um, HCPC registered at the time, I think the universities are now accepting them. However, some of the universities have got their own um, criteria and they are saying that they need a new assessment done. So it's worthwhile checking with the individual university. Yeah, I, I mean, that's my understanding as well. And the, the other thing is that ones that are done when people are children, you know, when, when, when things settle down, when they're adults, particularly if there's ADHD yeah. included, then, then things can change. So it's, uh, it's an open one. Okay, that was that. Was, that was that. I'll let you, I'll leave you with Anne Margaret. She's unmuted. So, uh, great. Hello, Margaret. And Margaret. Right. So, I'd like to, so I need to um, stop my sharing of the screen. Okay. So, I'd like to introduce you to, to Dr. Anne Margaret Smith. She started her teaching career in Kenya and has worked in Germany, Sweden, New Zealand, and the UK in private schools, primary schools, and universities. She set up Eltwell in 2005 in order to bridge the gap between the two fields of education that she's passionate about, English language teaching and support for learners with SVLD such as dyslexia. So Eltwell offer training and education and, and resources for inclusive language teaching. And it's also a research active organization as a team believe that good teaching practice is based on research 